Welcome to yet another episode of uh, One on One with Jeff Kinyanjui. And today I'm very much privileged to have uh, uh, the title winning coach, uh, Gormaya Tactician, Johnny McKinstry. Karibu sana. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's great to be here. Pleasure is all mine. Do you know any Swahili words so far? Yeah, a small amount, like pole pole, asante <laughs> sana, karibu, you know, a few things. And any, any Sheng word? Not so much. Any Lua word? You are Gormaya coach. I know this and it doesn't stick with me very well. The guys, some of, <laughs> some of our kit men come in and start talking to me in Luo, Luo first thing in the morning. And, yeah. you know, catching me at 7 a.m. in the morning with foreign languages <laughs> is not the best time for it to be absorbed. But you need to learn a word or two. Oh, exactly. I know. But uh, thank you so much for honoring my call. I know it's uh, the off season probably will be somewhere relaxing, so I don't take it for granted. So we go straight into it. Uh, you won the Kenyan Premier League. Uh, when you were taking this job at Gormaya, uh, uh, did you think that uh, at the end of the season you would uh, have won the league? I think it's definitely ahead of schedule. Um, for me, we came in and we always thought it was going to be a two-year project. We knew the challenges that the club were facing. And the chairman was very forthright with me. He said very early on, this is probably the most difficult period in the last 20 years to be the head coach of this club. Because it doesn't matter what's going on behind the scenes. The expectation from the public is for you to win. And so that expectation was there, but a transfer ban, a lean squad of only 18 outfield players, a lot of young players as well. You know, a lot of our, what might have been considered the star players from previous years left over yeah. the last 18 months. And so I don't think expectations were very high at the start of the season, inside or outside the club. But we just went about our work. You know, I've always felt between my staff and myself that we were able to impact players and, and make them better. You know, yeah. I think if you remember Jurgen Klopp saying when he came into Liverpool that it's easy just to go and sign players sometimes, but can you coach? Can you make the players in front of you better? Can you help them hit targets that previously they didn't think possible? And so for us, especially in the first half of the season, that was a real sort of focus point is how do we set targets? How do we support the players at getting better? And look, we always said we felt if we did our job well and people, the players committed to the process, that in the last month of the season, we'd be in the conversation for the league title. That was our target. It was, can we get to the final four games and be in the race? Yeah. And when we get there, then we can start seeing how do we get across that finish line. But definitely, had we finished second or third and went on to win it next year, that probably would have been more in keeping with the gradual sort of organic development of the team. But the players, I have to give full credit to them. They took on board what we wanted. They pushed beyond what should be reasonably expected of a small group of players. And we got the job done. So now we've just we've set a higher bar for ourselves for next season. At what point uh, of the season did you actually now see that uh, you stood a fair chance of winning the league? Uh, when we won away in Bandari. I think um, when we went to Mombasa and won 2-1 in what was a really difficult game, and it was probably the first game of the season where we had a really vocal support in the stadium, because obviously the first half coming out of COVID, off you know, the issues with FIFA and the FKF and government, the crowds in the league were down. Yeah. And that was sort of the first game. There had been some crowds at other games, but away in Mombasa was the first game I can really remember where there was a real vocal for 95 minutes Kogalo presence at the game that you really felt. And we went there and it was an extremely tough game as it always is away to Bandari. And we won. And I think coming off, you know, on the SGR, coming back to uh, Nairobi that night, I think there was a feeling that, okay, there's a few months to go in this. But actually, I think we've got the toughness and the grit that might just be needed to win this. Uh, you speak so passionately about the Kogalo fan base and, you know, even the fans traveling all the way to Mombasa. Uh, but the numbers have, haven't been what they were before. What has been the role of the fans? Of course, they are coming back, but not in, in good numbers as before. Uh, what has been the role of the 12th man uh, this season? Well, I think... You can see no better example of it than the final game against Nairobi City Stars. We were always super confident going into that game because we felt just, we always say to the players, you got to play the environment as well as the opposition. And we knew that as soon as we scored in that game, that 
because we had what 12, 13, 14,000 people in a Kasarani that day and the just the charge nature of the atmosphere, we knew that the moment we scored, that energy would just wash over the whole stadium. There wouldn't yeah. be any nervousness anymore yep. and that would almost sweep away city stars we knew that would happen and so even when they scored it wasn't a concern to us because we knew we would score at some point and we knew that once we did it wouldn't just be a 12th man it would be a 18th 19th 20th man in terms of the energy <laughs> yeah. and that's what happened and so I really hope and pray coming into the new season that the supporters obviously really did start coming back in their numbers towards the end of the season. They saw a team that was really willing to work and be passionate and, you know, has sort of Kogalo at their heart. You know, I always say it's it's something that an old player of Kogalo and an old player of mine, Jack Tuasenge, used yeah. to say. He said with the Rwandan team, you know, you've got to be willing to die a little bit every time you step on the pitch in pursuit of success. And I think we've got a group of players willing to do that. Yep. And so hopefully that encourages the fans to keep coming in their large numbers because the players love playing in front of that, even though it brings pressure. They love <laughs> it. And and it's going to help us have more success down the road. Uh, you speak about pressure. Do you feel any any time uh, you have a league match or a cup game, you know, it's, it's Gormaya, not just any, any other team? There's always pressure. I think coaching Kogalo is a really interesting thing and it's been a learning curve even for me this season is that in other jobs, if you're like two or three zero up in a game, the game is largely done. <laughs> you know, other yeah. teams, you can start passing the ball around. You can maybe sub some players out of the game. But because here in Kenya, every single player who does not play for Gormaya wants to play for Gormaya. And so they know that if they can score a goal or get an assist or make a great save or do something that catches the eye of the technical bench, you know, at the other side of the pitch, that maybe that can change their career. So yeah. what you find is, like I remember one game earlier in the season, we were 3-0 up against Talanta and there were <laughs> only like five minutes left of the yeah. game. <laughs> and Talanta were still playing as though it was nil-nil and they needed a goal to avoid relegation. That's the intensity they brought to the game. And so I think that's unique, not for Kenyan football, but for Kogalo. Because yeah. I, I go and watch our rivals play, whether I'm watching Tusker or Police or Bandari, and I don't see other teams bringing that level of energy to those games. So I think it's harder for us to win than for a lot of our, our rivals. But look, that's the pressure you got to want to play under. That's you know the environment because it makes you better. It means that if you win, you deserved it. I mean, uh, I think the second last of the game, uh, you dropped points. Mm -hmm. You also dropped points uh, against the uh, bitter rival CFC Leopards and the fans were up in arms, uh, you know, uh, calling for your resignation, calling for your sacking. But you seem to be, you know, so calm. You, you, you never uh, showed us any signs of pressure or anxiety. How do you manage to do this? I think, you know, I'm quite fortunate that, you know, I've had a lot of sort of contact with top people in the game. You know, I'm a member of the League Managers Association in England, and we do a lot of things, whether it's in person or virtually, where you learn from experiences and share experiences with other top coaches and managers. And a great saying that I'm sure everyone knows is the idea that you're never as good as they say you are, <laughs> nor are you ever as bad as they say you are. You just have to keep doing the work. And even my assistant coach, you know, Michael Nam, a great saying that he has is he's relaxed on match day because if, if you know the work Monday to Friday was good, then, then trust the players. Let them go and do it. And I think the work we're all putting in Monday to Friday, we can't work any harder. You know, we can't put more hours in. We can't, you know, be thinking more, discussing more. The players can't be pushing harder in training. So if you do that often enough, okay, you might be disappointed on any one given day. But over the course of 34 league games, which ultimately is the test of a champion, we always felt we would be there or thereabouts. So... The other thing as well is sometimes you got to step back from big disappointments and assess the match in itself. And there's been it's been funny this season because there's been some of our best performances this season have been in games where we've not got the three points. You know, even well, you mentioned the derby, obviously hugely disappointing, but it's a game where our rivals had two chances, a penalty and yeah. a corner where our center back slips over. Yet we miss a penalty. We have one cleared off the line. Their goalkeepers made three or four great saves. You know, we've, I think we, we looked back at it and said we had eight, maybe nine really good chances. 
and we didn't put them away. And our rivals had two chances. So on a performance level, 95% of the performance was good. But ultimately, we know the golden touch in football is that final 5% of putting yeah. it in the net. So we can't walk away from it and be happy with the performance, yet we lost. We've got to be unhappy about that we didn't convert. But we know if we do that often enough, you'll get the three points. So that allows you to maintain sort of composure and be relaxed. Okay. You talked about having a lean squad, a squad compromise of uh, largely untested uh, players, you know, coming off a transfer ban. Uh, but you still won the league. What was the secret? Well, I think there's sort of different ingredients to that recipe. I think for me, I've obviously got a, a history of working with young players. You know, before I came into the pro game a decade ago, I was working with elite level, level youth players, both in the USA and in West Africa, a lot of whom have went on to play international football and professional football around the world. And then even my history with the national teams, whether it was Rwanda, Uganda, Sierra Leone, I gave a lot of debuts to 16, 17, 18 year olds in place of senior players. And so for me, it's all about performance. It's all about sort of tapping into the psychology of a young player mm -hmm. and a senior player as well, because it's not just the young players who've done extremely well for us this season. Even you look at a player like Ernest Wando, I think this is probably one of his best seasons in a long time. He got better during the season because of the work he put in and because of the little maybe adjustments we tried to make and the people we put around him. So for us, it was about creating an environment where mistakes weren't the enemy. You know, one of the big things we say in training is if you're not making mistakes in training, it means you're not trying to get out of your comfort zone. If you're doing everything perfect in training, it means you found this little rhythm where you're happy with. But how does that help us win? You need to consistently be pushing the boundaries and trying to be better and better. And don't worry if you miss it in training. We're going to work on it. We're going to get better. And even in matches, you know, there's one or two matches during the seasons where the occasional player maybe did make a big mistake. But that happens in life. Yeah. Who, who of us doesn't make a mistake? We all make mistakes. Exactly. And so for us, it was about not not hanging those players out to dry. It was understanding that it's part of the process and just showing them how to improve and I think we got that right this season and that's not just about me that's about all of our staff we created we were very clear at the start of the season how we wanted to go about it and the staff got on board with it and and yet together we were able to create that real positive work environment you speak so fondly about uh, Wendo it's not just on this interview I've read uh, other interviews where you speak so fondly of him he's not in the national team setup I think he has had less than three call-ups uh, what makes him tick? Why is he such an important player for Gormaya? I think in football, you're always looking for these guys that you think are like the ultimate professionals. You know, they're in early, they're doing their activation work with the bonds, with whatever stuff you've got laid out, even before training. So their training mm -hmm. starts before training. And mm -hmm. so that when that whistle goes, they're ready and they're going to make sure that that 90 minutes of training they're maximizing. It's like there's that saying, you know, squeezing all the juice out of the lemon. You know, can you make the most out of your time? And I think someone like Ernest really does look to do that. Um, he doesn't waste his time. He's been around the game long enough that he knows that this 90 minutes, I got to make the most out of it today. And then I'll come back and do it again tomorrow so that when we get to the weekend, I'm ready for the match. And he looks after his body, the stuff he's doing off the field. You know, he's not running around, you know, at shopping malls and visiting friends for 10 hours a day. He knows, look, this is my job. I want to make the most out of it. And I'm going to I'm gonna do what's right off the pitch as well as on the pitch. And he's not the only one. We've got several players like that, you know, the likes of Jeffrey O'Chang, the likes mm -hmm. of, you know, even Benson this season, I think, has shown, you know, great maturity. He's a young player. But if you look at a photograph of Benson in preseason and look at a photograph of him now, you can see the physical development yeah, yeah. that's went on there. And a lot of that is in his own time in order to develop and and that's added a lot to being the goal scorer that he is today so yeah i just think it's that professional nature but also you know guys it was funny before we came in i was having a lot of phone calls with our players or text conversations with players before i came in here and Ernest is always the one he's a man of few words <laughs> but he does it with his actions and yeah. that's the best way to be show us what you've got don't tell us show us uh, you said that uh, you had to tweak a little, uh, some things in, in some aspects of his game. What has changed so much? You know, before I've watched him for a couple of season, seasons, he was always getting carded. 
you know, a very physical player, but that seems to have changed. Yeah, I think for us, we give very defined roles in the midfield. You know, a lot of player, a lot of teams maybe think of midfielders as offensive, like the number 10s or defensive, a number six. And the idea of a traditional number eight who plays box to box yep. has sort of disappeared from the game a little bit, although is starting to come back in in the last year or two. And so for us, I think we very much said to Ernest, look, we don't need you charging around the pitch all the time. You know, we want you to be that pivot. We want you to be the guy who's almost sitting in front of the back four and almost like a nightclub bouncer, <laughs> you know, we're not letting you in. You know, if you're not allowed in here, you're not getting in. And and leave the idea of, you know, going and doing the aggressive pressing to the likes of Alpha Nyango, Sidney O'Chang, John O'Chang, you know, even Austin in the number 10 position. Don't feel the need that you need to be charging around the pitch so much. Be the conductor, be the general in there. A bit like Roy Keane did yeah. later in his career. Because if you think about it, when Roy Keane, anyone who's old enough to remember him in his early 20s, he was very much a box-to-box -box yeah. midfielder. But by the time he was in his 30s, he was much more, I'm going to sit in as the number six and I'm going to manage everything. And I think that's sort of the phase Ernest is at now where we just want to make him comfortable. Like... Don't get me wrong, if I said to him, go and be the number eight, he would go and love to do it. Yep. But again, it's about maximizing not just his qualities, but also the qualities of the guys around them and making sure they complement each other. Yeah. Uh, I think you've lost Kagimu, one of the best uh, players for the team this season. Uh, can you confirm that he's he's already left? Yeah, no, Shafiq has left. Um, Shafiq was an opportunistic opportunity for Gore. Um, it was a player that I never really thought we'd be able to get. Obviously, I've got a long history of Shafiq. Um, didn't think he was a player we'd be able to get. Um, he had an opportunity in Europe, which was slightly delayed. And so we came to an agreement with him that he would come here to Gore, and but we would not stand in his way if that European opportunity materialized. And ultimately, that's what's happened. You know, he's going up. I know he's do, going through the visa process. He's got his contract and he'll be playing in the European leagues next season, where I think he'll do fantastically well. You know, when he's got a good pitch to play on every week, yeah. you know, it, one of the reasons some people were a bit maybe unsure of why some weeks he was in the team and other weeks he wasn't. But if you put Shafiq on Kasarani, he's the best player on the pitch. But if you put him at, you know, at Thika, <laughs> it's maybe not the same surface yeah. uh, where he his his skill set. Whereas when he goes to Europe, so it's sad for me because I know what a good player he is and I know what he can bring to the team. But ultimately, the conversation he and I had at the very beginning was this might be a short thing. We don't know. Maybe it'll be a long thing. And we did say if he wants to stay, we'll extend the contract. And but ultimately his dream has always been Europe and you can't stand in the way yeah, of it. Sure. And, you know, he actually, he went back to Uganda. He was doing his visa process here, only traveled to Uganda a couple of days ago to yep. now organize things to travel to Europe. Um, but he was round at my house for sort of tea a few nights ago. And again, it was that sort of, it's a sad moment that he's going. Yep. But I think when I spoke to him, I said to him, look, come here, help us win this league title. And then if the opportunity comes, will not stand in your way. And that's what's happened. So yeah. we wish him the very best. Now Absolutely. that he's gone, does the role of Wendo become even more important now for uh for you as the Gormaya coach? I've also just seen when I was coming in here that uh, I think it's Geoffrey who's also announced his departure. Uh is it Geoffrey? The John. midfielder. Yeah John John O'Cheng, sorry for that. He's also announced his departure. Is he gone as well? Yeah so John requested his release um from the club. And so whilst it was one that we think John is a player who has a huge amount of potential, he's also a player who wants to play. Yep. And at this moment in time, we don't guarantee anybody a starting place. Nobody's guaranteed a starting place. Like you've even seen this season that there's been games when Omal has been on the bench. Yep. And there's been reasons behind the scenes for that, whether that's been performance and training or whatever it might have been. But no one in our team, even young Cal Abotieno started against Vahiga Bullets earlier in the season and Gad Matthew found himself on the bench. So no one in my team is guaranteed a starting place. You've got to work for it. And so, but John just felt at this point in his career, he wanted more certainty of a starting 11 place. And that's something we couldn't give him. 
Um, mm. And so we wish them all the very best. But equally, we've got good options in the midfield. You know, we're bringing one or two players in. Uh, Sidney O'Cheng, Alpha Nyango, yeah. great quality in different ways. Wendo's there. And, you know, we'll be announcing our signings in the next week. But we've got some real good quality coming in. So whilst we naturally change is never easy, and we wish those players all the best, but we think what we've got coming in, we'll have a better a better lineup this season. It's interesting that you speak of signings. I was going to ask this question. Uh, uh, I've seen, of course, in uh, in tabloids, uh, God being linked with uh, a defender from, um, I think, City Stars, is it Kennedy Onyango? Uh, would you confirm the same? I've also seen uh, a couple of uh, uh, you know media saying that uh, obviously the best uh, left, uh, left-footed centre-back Nganga is also leaving. Uh, would you mind clarifying that? Yeah, so in terms of Dennis, uh, there's a few players who were out of contract this summer. Um, we had an agreement, I had a personal agreement with Dennis that if he was going to stay in Kenya, that he would sign a new contract with Kogalo. And the negotiations went on with that on that basis. But ultimately, you got to remember, Dennis is 30 this year. And he had his eye. There was some interest back in January. In fact, there was an offer for him to leave in January to go outside of Kenya. But because the transfer ban was still there and our transfer window was later, even he understood that we couldn't possibly let him go. Um, it, was, it would have been disastrous because we wouldn't have had another. It would have only been Joshua Nyango available at center back at that point. So it would have been a big problem. So he agreed he'd wait until the end of the season. He has had another offer from outside that, let's be realistic, are going to pay him four or five times as much as any Kenyan team can afford. And Mm -hmm. so if you were 21, I would be saying, look, be patient, because if you tie yourself into another contract with a team, you know, in another African nation, maybe you won't get your opportunity to go to the highest level. But if you're 30, you got to also be appreciative that he's got to look after his family. You yep. know, he's got a long, there's a long life after being a football player. You've yeah, got definitely. another 50, 60 years, hopefully, after yep. that. And so for him to go and earn the money he's able to earn in a different country, we wish him all the best. It's sad for us, but, you know, he, he rang and he told me directly when the offer came in. And so I've got no problem with that. We, we treat our players like adults, like men. Um, and I think if anyone said, to you, would you go somewhere else for five times your salary? I would definitely go. So you understand that this isn't, and also it's a good team he's going to, I believe. And yeah, so it's disappointing. In terms of the incomings, um, I've seen a lot of stuff in terms of the press and only one of them that I've seen um, is is real. You know, there's a lot of fiction out there. You know, you mentioned <laughs> the defender, you mentioned some other players um, that I've read about who we've, been beaten to the signings of by other rival teams. But I can genuinely say that every article I've read like that, we've never even been in discussions with these players. Okay, so coach. I so I don't know whether it's like brokers or agents are trying <laughs> to are trying to increase the market value of their players, you know, so that one of our rivals pays more for them. And if if they're doing that successfully, then well done to them. But, you know, for us, yeah, I think we We will announce our signings, and only one of them has really been mentioned in the press. Okay, Coach, so I'll I'll be blunt here. Uh, You've been linked with uh, Kennedy Onyango, a centre-back from City Stars. Would you confirm that there's any interest or you've signed him? Because I've seen a lot of that, and it's good to have you you here to clarify such things. Yeah, we have not had any negotiations with him. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, Then there's, of course, Tyson, uh, a very good midfielder, Uh, I think... Uh, Austin, your midfielder is also, I mean, he's, uh, Austin's, uh, Austin's the brother to Tyson, mm-hmm. younger brother. Have you been interested in him? He just recently signed for police and there was yeah. heavy linkage to Gormaya. We, we never inquired about Tyson. Uh, Tyson's, really? Yeah, we never inquired. Uh, Tyson's a player who we respect massively. He's He's got big talent. But when you're building a football team, it's how do you, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You've got to have pieces that fit together. You just can't cram the puzzle pieces together and hope it looks nice. You've got to pick the right pieces. And so for us, we just didn't see anywhere where a player like Tyson would work in our midfield. Because for us, Austin, obviously the younger brother by six years, and he's had a fantastic season this year. Fantastic. And he's only going to get better. And so for me, 
I just didn't see how Tyson and Austin would be able to play together in a well-balanced midfield. Maybe if you were playing against a weaker opponent, then yes, you can play lots of flair players together in the midfield. But for us, we like what Austin's doing. We like what the guys behind him are doing in terms of Wando, Alpha, Sydney. And we are adding a couple of midfielders, which you'll see in due course. But yeah, Tyson was never a player we inquired about, was never a player we had any negotiations with. And so, yeah, if someone's been able to use the Kogalo brand <laughs> to try and up his value for another team, well, maybe that's just them doing their job. But for us, it was never anything. We, we, were, we, we, we were never in that race. Uh, that's very interesting. And now speaking of Austin, um, uh, there's also transfer speculation. I think he's out of contract. Uh, have you managed to sort that? Well, because he's he not, looks like a very important player to you. Yeah, he's not actually out of contract. Um, he's got several months of his contract left. Oh, okay. Um, we will. I think it's not done yet, but we'll get the, a new contract done for Austin. You know, I was speaking to him last night. He's very calm about the situation. Um, so... We are, we are sorting out a new contract. I think we're 98% of the way there on it. But um, yeah, he's also not out of contract. So yeah. he's, again, the reporting that's out there is is inaccurate. You know, he's he, he's under contract. So Interesting. And looking at your squad, what are those particular areas that you think need strengthening? You mentioned that uh, you've already made a couple of signings. Uh, you'll announce in due course. What are these key areas that you need to strengthen? Yeah, I think, well, for us, one is competition throughout the squad. I think it's very important to have, you know, not just one, but two options in pretty much every position. So we've had to do that. And I think it, that's been especially true in the offensive line. So not necessarily at striker, because we obviously have Benson and we have Patrick Cadu, who are great competition for each other and different types of players. But in the line behind that, if you look at the amount of goals we've scored from that line, now Austin did very well in terms of, I think he finished the season on nine goals and maybe seven or eight assists, which is good. Um, sort of 15 or more goal contributions when you add everything together. But beyond that, no one else got into double figures for goal contributions. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, Peter Loasa was lower numbers. George Odiambo was lower numbers. John Macharia was lower numbers. Bonface Omondi was okay numbers, but still not above that magic 15 number that we have. And so we, we will, we're adding competition in that mm -hmm. line where we just think, because it's not like our number nines can score the goals. There's no doubt about that. So if you said that Benson or Patrick would have another 20 plus goal, a season, or goal season, that's what you want from your number nine. It's not realistic to think that your number nine is going to score 40 goals. So where do you get the other goals from? We need to start getting more from that offensive line, the number sevens, the number tens, the number elevens. So we've added a bit more competition there. We wanted a little bit more depth um, in midfield as well, where we've added a bit of competition. And also in goal, we just wanted a little bit more competition. So um, I think the depth in the squad, we're sort of doing two things that almost seem contrary to each other. We're giving the squad more depth yeah. in terms of competition, but we're reducing the squad numbers. So because we were able to sign players, we sort of jumped from having sort of 20 players in the first leg to 29 in the second leg last season. We're going to reduce that down to about 25, 26 because we want that real competition. Uh, with Loasa gone, you said you need offensive players. Uh, do you think Loasa is a, is a big loss to the club with all due respect to the player? I mean, uh, and are you looking at, uh, you know, replacing him directly? Yeah, Peter is a top player. There's no doubt about that. Um, that's not a closed book. Um, mm -hmm. That's not a closed book. Um, we don't necessarily know which way it will go at this point in time, but it's not a closed book. Um, but he's a quality player. I think the one thing with Peter that us or any team need to try to unlock is consistency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on certain days, he can be top, top quality. And on other days, it's just not quite there. And look, that happens in different ways for different players. You, If you go back 12 months, you would have said the exact same thing about Austin. You yeah. would have said the exact same thing about Benson. Um, whereas we've managed to find the sort of little bit of magic in terms of how we work with them in order to get consistency. And mm -hmm. that's the key thing for any young player. And so, you know, for Peter, we know how good he can be. 
but it's about just what he needs to be consistent every single week. I know speaking of uh, Benson Omala, uh, second leading scorer last season, uh, but he's not been really a regular player in the national team and there's a lot of talk about that. Uh, a lot of coaches and uh, you know pundits saying that there's an aspect of his game that he needs to improve on. Uh, in just a few words, having worked with him for one season, what sort of player is he and do you think he has uh, what it takes to get to the top level? Yeah, 100%. I don't think you jump to the top level overnight. It's a stage process. You know, you even look at when players like Wanyama went to Europe. Yeah. He doesn't jump to to Celtic or Tottenham. It's it's step by step. And Benson has that same future if he wants it, and I think he does want it. Um, for me, he's a player who's best running towards goal. He's a front-facing forward. Um, I mentioned before how him and Patrick Cadu are different players. Patrick is a is a backwards, you know, back to goal forward. So Patrick would rather receive the ball into his chest, yeah. into his feet, whereas Benson would rather receive the ball in the space for him to run on to in behind. So they're very different strikers. Um, you know, we unlocked that with Benson this season. We we wanted him to have less touches. Um, I remember seeing a scouting report of someone I really respect um, a while back about Benson, and he asked me to look at it. And, and it, one of the things was a criticism they had of Benson, and it was that he doesn't drop in to touch the ball more. Yeah. And I said, I was like, you should change that. That's, that shouldn't be a criticism. It should be an observation, but not a criticism. Because when we first came, the very first game, Benson was dropping into like the number eight position all the time to touch the ball. And I, we pulled him across and said, you've got to stop doing that. Because if you want to be a supreme goal scorer, you've got to worry about the space behind the center backs not the space in front of them so much. And so we started focusing on that. How can he get into what I call this like imaginary goal scoring box behind the center box? And how do you get into that? How do you time your runs? What's your movement to get in there? And we did little things with him. And when he started getting into that position more, he's scoring not just one or two more goals, but 20 more goals than he did last season. And But he's touched the ball less. He has touched the ball less. And so I think in the modern era, everyone looks at footballers and wants the perfect player. Yeah. Oh, this player can't do that. This <laughs> player can't do that. But guess what? He can score one and two touch inside the box, which a lot of players can't do. Yeah. You wouldn't criticize Ernest Wando for not scoring 26 goals a season. <laughs> so why, yeah. should you, why should you criticize Benson Omala for not dropping into midfield and getting touches? He's not Lionel Messi. <laughs> nor will he ever be. And so yeah. it's about playing on players' strengths. Now, as for his role with the national team, I think that will grow over time. Every coach has his way of playing. I think the way Kogalo play and the way the Harambi Stars play is different. There's no doubt about that. It is different. And that's okay. The way Liverpool and Manchester City play is different. That's okay. Um, and so... It's just about the national team finding out how to unlock the best out of him when they need him. I'm sure that will happen. He's a young man. He's only 21 years old. He's got a big, big time in football ahead of him. So, yeah, I'm not worried about that. A lot of talk about his, uh, his first touch, especially on the, on the final third. What do you have to say about that? You said he's, young, he's a young player. Do you think he has, uh, I mean, does he have the time to improve on that, especially if he's looking to play in, in Europe where you don't have that much space? given to strikers. No, I, I think he's improving all the time with it. Um, look, I also don't think it's a bad touch. Um, <laughs> you know, I think people, there is one goal this season where you can say, okay, that was a heavy first touch, yeah. which was the goal against police, um, where we scored the winning goal against police, if I'm not wrong. And, um, but actually, if you go and look back over his 26 goals, a lot of the reason he scores is because of the first touch he takes. Yeah. You know, so like there was a great goal he scored against, um, uh, I think it was maybe against Bidco or Posta Rangers at Thika. Yeah. And the ball comes across to him and he takes a beautiful first touch out in front of him that puts him between the ball and the defender. But it's the perfect way just to invite the goalkeeper a little bit, but knowing that he was going to get the next touch and then he slides it past the goalkeeper. So, you know, I don't think it's a big issue. Can everyone improve on it? But can everyone in Kenya improve on it? Because you've got to remember, a lot of guys here grew up playing on pitches where the ball's bouncing around yeah, yeah. all over the place. And so sometimes that perfect first touch 
hasn't developed in the same way a player with better resources growing up would develop. And so I think it's, I think it's okay. It can, there's always room for improvement, but I think it's okay. Now, you, you mentioned about pitches, and uh, it's an interesting time to talk about that because uh, just recently the, uh, the club co confirmed that it will be hosting its matches uh, at the Chamazi Complex in Tanzania. Uh, how does that make you feel as a coach hosting your, your home continental matches away from your own fans, away from the country? What are your thoughts about that? Well, I think it's a great disappointment for the fans, first of all, because, you know, supporters, especially those who come in week in, week out throughout the season, they want to see us playing against the top teams. They want to see us competing in the Champions League. And we obviously don't know who we will play yet, but they want to come to those matches. And, and as I've said already, you know, the influence of those supporters, if we've got, you know, 10, 15,000, you know, of the Green Army in the stadium can really add to our performance levels, our energy levels. And so to not have that will be a blow. There's no doubt about that. Now, do I also expect that a large number of Kogalo fans will travel to watch us? I think I think there'll be a number. I also think if we're playing in Tanzania, there's also a good amount of Gore fans in Tanzania, which will also help to a degree, but there's no place like home. We would much rather be playing at Kasarani. There's no doubt about that. Um, I also think, you know, I know there's an ever increasing drive for standards to be improved, but, you know, I've been in African football for a long time and, you know, over a decade now and Kasarani is a good football stadium. It's a really good pitch. Simon, the groundsman there does great work on the pitch and um, it's one of the best pitches in East Africa, right up there. The Amahoro in Rwanda is also a great football pitch, but yeah, I would easily say that Kasarani as a surface is in the top five that I've played on across the continent, yeah. easily. Um, we've obviously seen that they've installed around 40,000 seats in the last year and done other little bits. And look, I know there's more stuff that is needed, but you know, my appeal would be to the people making these decisions at calf level is it shouldn't be a hard black and white line. It should be are people making steady progress to meet the standards. And if yeah. they are, that there should be some sort of leniency shown. Because the other thing as well is, with all due respect, I don't think, let's say, for example, we get drawn to play APR from Rwanda. Yeah. I don't think there's going to be 60,000 people at Kasarani to watch the game. There might be 20,000, yeah. but 20,000 in a 60,000-seater stadium, That's I don't think needs the same high criteria mark as Kenya versus Egypt. Yeah, sure. So I, I support the need for improving standards on and off the field. But at the same time, if you then think about the money that's having to be spent to take this game to another country, could that money not be better spent for the development of football? Yeah, definitely um, would. You know, I would, I would understand if, if the stadiums here were crumbling and were old <laughs> stadiums that were yeah. falling apart, but that's not the case with Kasarani. It's not the case with Niayo. And so... Yeah, I, I don't know if that's a closed book yet. If if the I know we're prepared to play outside if it's needed. I hope that there might be something that can be done about that to give the supporters here first and foremost the opportunity to see Champions League and not just for us, Confederations Cup football for homeboys. Uh, speaking of the Cup Champions League, uh, are, are you looking forward to that? You know, it's 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 been a while since uh, uh, Gormaya went to the continental scene. Uh, the score that you have, do you have the faith in it that uh, uh, it can get past the group stages of the CAF Champions League? Bearing in mind the success the clubs in Tanzania have had, uh, there's always that uh, competition between clubs in Kenya, especially Gormaya, with all due respect to the other clubs, with the likes of Simba and Dianga. Yeah. With the squad you have at the moment, you said you have four more quality players you're adding. Do you have faith that uh, you have what it takes to conquer Africa? Or what are the targets that you, you've set for the team continentally? So first of all, we're very much looking forward to it. You know, playing at that top level, those competitive games, you know, the games we've loved the most this past season have been against our rivals, whether it's been Tusker, AFC, Police, you know, the teams right in and around us. So to go and compete against the best teams on the continent raises the bar again. So we're very much looking forward to that. I know the club are looking forward to it, the supporters, but also the players because it's, as a player, it's where you want to play on that platform, you know, to have that exposure. And so we're really looking forward to that. The Champions League is going to be a difficult proposition. Um, I'm not sure that everyone knows, but 
the the structure of the competitions has changed for yeah, this yeah. season. Yeah. So if you look when Gore, I think it was in 2018, 2019, got to the quarterfinals of the Confederations Cup, um, when they went into the group stages, the back then, if you got knocked out of the Champions League drop- in round two, you dropped in to the Confederations Cup. That has now been removed. Yeah, yeah. So now, if you're a Champions League team, there's no second chance. If you get knocked out, you're That's out. That's it, yeah. And so that has changed the criteria a lot because even you mentioned the teams in Tanzania, but for example, what Yanga did last season is no longer possible because mm. Yanga were champions got beaten in round two of the Champions League, yeah, dropped into the Confederations Cup, went all the way to the final. Yeah. That is no longer possible. And so it makes it a lot more difficult. There is no second by the cherry. Gore in the modern age have not been into the group stage of the Champions yeah. League. They've been into the group stages of the Confederations Cup through the second chance mechanism. Yeah. So for us, we're waiting to see who the draw is. Um, we first of all have to get past the first round. That's the key thing. Um, I believe we have the quality to do that. And then you've got to really look into who you play against because, look, I think everyone knows where Kenyan football is in terms of budgets. Yeah. And it's been, it was really interesting have a, having a conversation with Captain uh, Ronald Karure, uh, the Sport Pacer CEO, because obviously Sport Pacer are involved with Yanga as well. Yeah. And he was able to tell me that not just from Sport Pacer, but from multiple sponsors, Yanga are bringing in around $5 million a year revenue, plus another million dollars a year in ticket sales. So already, before you even talk about prize money or TV money or all of that, they're bringing in between 5 and $6 million a year. Now, it won't surprise you to say that Gore's budget is well under a million. <laughs> so now we're talking about, let's compare us and Yanga directly. Yanga have at least six to seven times the budget that we have. And Yanga are not the big fish in the African pond. They are a medium-sized fish. The likes of Mamelodi Sundown, Zamalek, Al Ahly. You know, Al Ahly's budget might be 30 to 40 million in a year because they're spending a million dollars to sign a player. Yep. And so at the end of the day, it's 11 men versus 11 men <laughs> over like two that. games. And so everything is possible. Everything yep. is possible. But we also have to understand that. If we end up getting drawn, because that's the other thing, only six teams go automatically to the group stages. We could be drawn to play against Zamalek in the knockout stages. Yeah. Can we beat them? Yes, we can. Is it going to be easy to do that? No, it's not. You're aware Gore has beaten uh, Zamalek at Kasarani before? I'm aware. But again, the game has changed. Yeah. Every year, the game has changed. It's even the same. If you go back, let's go back to the Mandela Cup in 1987. <laughs> the money that a Kenyan team were spending was similar to the money an Egyptian team were spending. That's not the case anymore. So, But look, in the same way as in the FA Cup in England, a third division team can knock out a Premier League team, is the same way that a team with our budget can knock out a team with 10 times that budget. Because the checkbook doesn't play the match. The players do. (laughs) And so for us, we've got to make sure that our preparations are right. And look, we want to go as far as we can in it. Um, we're going to do everything we can, but we've got to look after one game at a time. So we're waiting for the draw to find out who we have in the first round, yeah. um, and we'll take it from there. Uh, if this is the sort of mentality you're going on uh, with to, to the continental level, uh, does this again mean that you have total faith in the squad you have? Will you have done anything different if you had the resources? Will you have gotten those big-name players, you know, you mentioned the young guy signing big big players, very quality players. If things were to be done different and you had uh, you had a good budget from the club and from your sponsors, well, would you rejig the squad a bit and add more quality? Well, look, first of all, I think the club and the sponsors are doing a lot of really good stuff. You know, I feel very much supported by everyone involved. You know, I gave my list of targets to the club and we've achieved almost all of them in terms of who we wanted to bring in. Now, that list was created with our budget in mind. Yep. But I think everyone saw the transfer ban ending last year and seeing that as maybe, is that, oh, gore back. That's the end of our challenges. We're not 100% back. We were walking that path, but we are still not as healthy as we were five or 10 years ago. 
There's no doubt about that. We are on our way back. The league championship, like I say, has maybe come a year earlier than we anticipated. And we are making real positive steps. But in order to continue that journey back to full health and full strength, we have to look after our finances. We can't go out and spend crazy money on yeah. players. To give you an example, you know, I obviously have a lot of contacts in the African game. And even I, I rang up some players who I knew were coming out of contract, guys playing in Ethiopia, guys playing in Djibouti, um, guys playing in Tanzania. And I was saying to them, look, would you be interested at the project here at Kogalo? And the answer was always yes. We'd definitely be interested in coming and working with you again, coach. Gore, a big club on the continent. But then I ask a player in Ethiopia, how much are you earning? And he's telling me $5,000 a month. <laughs> now, we can't afford that. No team in Kenya can afford that. This is where football has changed. If you went back five or 10 years, you would say that St. George and Gore and Simba and Yanga financially oh, the we're level. all on the same level that's yep. not the case anymore Yanga and Simba are paying 10 times what we are in salaries Ethiopian teams are paying five or three or four times what we're paying in salaries so we know the markets we can shop in but it's not the same as it was five or ten years ago and so we've got to be smart with how we spend our money trying to win today but also making sure we continue on that path to being a fully recovered and strong football club and not just a strong football team. And so that's the balance we've got to help. So look, you're saying if I had more money, well, if I had more money, I would go out and sign Lionel Messi. But <laughs> that's not possible. We don't yeah. live in that world. I think who we've got in, we are very happy with. We are very happy with the guys we're adding to the squad. We think they will increase the quality and the competition in the squad and will drive us forward. But look, the signings are not just about competing in CAF. Yep. The signings are about retaining our league title. Because mm -hmm. if you think that Tusker, Police, Bandari, KCB are going to sit around and do nothing over the offseason then I think you would be fooling yourself. We already see what the movements some of them are making, the money some of them are spending. And there are clubs there that if they want to outspend us, they can. Some of the guys who are re-signing with us are doing so because they believe in what we're doing. They've been offered more money by our rivals, but they've said, no, we want to play for Kogalo. Yep. And so we're going to take the lesser contract to come and play in that green shirt. And that's the attitude I want. I want players who want to wear that shirt. And so, but we've got to, like, if we didn't strengthen the team, the title, because look, it took 70 points to win it this season. And look, 70 points, if you go back over the last 20 years, you know, and ranked every team over the last 20 years, you probably have about 300 teams, you know, 18 yeah. teams, 18 teams, 16 teams, 16 teams. You'd have about 300 teams. Our 70 point total last season ranks fifth out of those 300 teams over the last 20 years. So it was a good season. And the only four teams who've bettered that have been Gormaya teams on 72, 73, 75, and 78 points. But it's going to take more to win it next season. I think it's going to take maybe 75 or 76 points to win this league next season. So we need to improve just to maintain our championship. Interesting numbers, Coach. And uh, I'm a big fan of uh, sports data. Uh, when you mentioned that... Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the quality of the league uh, in the past season, the quality of the Kenyan league. Um, probably they say Gormaya won because uh, teams have gotten weaker, the league has gotten weaker. What would you say about that? Well, I think the evidence just doesn't back that theory up. You know, if you look at Tusker got 69 points, that's more points than Tusker scored in any of their title winning seasons. Um, in fact, 69 points is the highest that any team outside of Gormaya has gotten the last 20 years. You know, so second place was more points than any second place team has gotten recent memory. Third place was more points. Fourth place was more points. The top five collected more points this season than at any time in the last 15 to 20 years. And like I said, only Kogalo have ever hit the 70-point mark in the modern era of the KPL era, last 15 or so years. We managed to do it again this season. So the idea that the league was weak this season just doesn't stack up. Because when you look at the, the data, when you look at the statistics, 
our rivals scored more points. Even you go back to the, the Gore team that scored 78 points, which is the record in the modern era. The second place team that season, I think, had 58 or 59. There was like a 20-point gap. We had to give it everything. We had no room to rest this season. And, and we know we need more next season. Now, Coach, I'll, I'll take you back to, uh, to continental football. Uh, with the squad you have, you've added a few, uh, a few, a few players, quality players like uh, Kevin Juma, highly rated uh, midfielder, and the few that you don't want to mention at the moment. Uh, what's the realistic target you have for the team uh, continentally? We want to get into the group stages. There's no doubt that that's where we want to be. Yeah. And I think if you look at our friends over in Uganda, Vipers, last year, they showed it is possible. Um, TP Mazembe in that second round game, they beat on penalties last yeah. year in Lubumbashi. A penalty shootout in Lubumbashi is not a is not a it's thing not most of us would ask for. <laughs> um, yeah. I've, I've played in that stadium myself. It's an intimidating atmosphere. Yeah. And um, so they showed that it's possible. Yeah. Um, but like I said, it's not easy. And so for us, we know the players in our squad, we can do it, but everything needs to be right. Everything needs to be right. Um, I think the best way to look at where we are in our development is a bit like when you see Celtic or Rangers competing in the Champions League. Yeah. yeah? So they are capable. I remember a few years ago, Celtic beating Barcelona yeah. at, at Parkhead in, in Glasgow. It is possible to go and get those big results. And so an equally Celtic are this huge football team with a huge history and passionate fan base. So in many ways, similar to Kogalo. But are we the biggest fish in the African football environment? We're uh, not at this moment in time. Yeah. And so we need to work our way back to that. That starts with winning our first round game and, and then hopefully winning our second round game. And if we can get into the group stages, that money would yeah, change. Yeah. Because I think now everyone's seen now, just for competing in the group stages of the Champions League, you get $700,000. Yeah. That changes a club. That means we're able to do stuff, maybe actually build a training ground um, <laughs> so that we don't have to go to different venues around the city. And it can really change the future of the club. But there's a lot of, there's what, 64 teams across Africa trying to do the same thing. Yeah. And there's only 16 places in the group stages. For me, I don't know. It's obviously not going to happen this season. For me, I do think if you're going to say there's no second chance in the Confederations Cup, that they should look to expand the Champions League to maybe mm -hmm. six groups of four, so 24 teams, and yeah. then work out how you get to the quarterfinals. But 16 teams who get to that top table of all of Africa, it, it's high quality. We have the ability to do it, but there's, there's going to be other teams who are going to be doing everything they can to stop us as well. I wish you the very best uh, continentally. I mean, that's the cream of African football and we are looking forward to that. Oh, thank you. But you, you mentioned about uh, uh, training pitches and it's, it's pathetic that uh, at this uh, point of time, you're still talking about uh, a club of Gormaya's stature not having a training pitch. I know for a fact that you train at uh, Camp Toyoyo. I've trained there as, as well. Uh, it's not the best pitches. It's not the best quality. Uh, and I know you mentioned before that you, you like playing at Kasarani because of the surface. Your players like playing at uh, Kasarani because of the playing surface. Yet, you train at an artificial turf that is dilapidated. What do you have to say about that? And have you had any talks with the, you know, the club's leadership, the sponsors about at least having something, uh, I mean, uh, just a decent training pitch? So, first of all, this season, it's going to be a lot better. Um, myself and some of the guys on the sort of logistical, sort of administrative side of the club have been working very hard, not even just in the off season, for the last three or four months to make sure that our training base this coming season is, is at the level required. And I think it's like 98% done. I think everything's agreed, even schedules, training schedules have been exchanged with the, the providers. And I just don't know, I don't know if the contract has been signed yet, but I know it's, it's all but done. Um, it's just the ink needs to go on the page, I think. And so we're going to be in a lot better situation this season. And, you know, I've been involved in that heavily in selecting it, but other people have been involved in doing a lot of the running around and the, the organization to make sure it happens. So it's not something that people are unaware of. 
Everyone knows okay. that we need to do better. Um, and we are going to do better this season. In fact, I dare say we'll probably have one of the best arrangements for our training in the league this coming season, assuming it goes ahead. But that wasn't easy because we looked at various venues and some looked positive and then people almost just stopped communicating with us. So sometimes people think it's the club's fault. But, you know, there was one organization who I spent personally a lot of time, you know, maybe two or three months going through just all the stuff that we would do. And it was going to be a partnership, not just us renting the facilities. And then they just stopped communicating. And it's sort of like, well, hold on, we've put all this work in and now you're not even picking up the phone or you're not responding to emails. And so people think that it's always the club who are falling short. But actually, from personal experience, we've put a lot of legwork into trying to get partnerships off the ground for the other side to back away from them, but not even communicate that they're backing away from them. Because it's okay, you can choose not to do something, but at least have the respect to say, this isn't for us. So, you know, we've worked very hard on it this season to make sure. But the other thing I would say as well is, you know, last year, we didn't have many options. Yeah. Um, we were training a lot at Camp Toyoyo. But also because the club knew that that wasn't good enough for what me and the technical bench wanted the team to be, we were also paying every week to train at Kasarani Annex one oh, or two days a week, which is very expensive, yeah, is. I have to say. No other team, no other team in the KPL were utilizing that facility for training. But we were every week, one or two days a week. And that was a big expense. And so again, you know, there's a lot of criticism goes to the management of the club, but people don't see that, that they were finding the money yeah. to spend on what is probably the most expensive training facility in Nairobi at least one or two days a week so that we had that surface to prepare on um, leading into our match day. So we're working on it. Um, it's not our permanent home by any means. I think it's well documented that the club are pursuing the land that was yeah. sort of gifted to them by President Moy many years ago. Um, that's not my area of expertise. I couldn't tell you how far along that journey they are, but I know it's something they want to do. Um, but land is not cheap. And yeah, so, you know, that's the thing. It's like people think it's easy to set up a training ground, but the pursuit of land that has been gifted to us is vital because if you've not only got to build training pitches, build accommodation blocks, build canteens, gyms, and you've got to buy the land, again, where does this money come from? Um, so hopefully we get that sorted with Sport Kenya and with sort of the lands authority in the near future and we're able to, we're able to do that because I think that will secure the long-term future of the club. Uh did you just confirm that from next season you'll not be training? I mean, from uh, when you kick off your preseason, you'll be training at uh, Camp Toyoyo? That is the plan. My plan is based at another facility from this weekend. Mind, uh, mind, mind saying which facility is this that you're moving to? We haven't. The ink isn't on the paper yet. So <laughs> verbal agreements are in place, but the okay. ink's not in the paper yet. So, and I, But that's not even just for us. People might think, oh, I don't want to say something in case we get embarrassed if we yeah. don't get it. But I also think it's disrespectful to the other side of that agreement yeah. to yeah. sort of name them without their permission to do so yeah. once it's ink on the paper. But I think we're 98% there. I understand that perfectly, coach, and I wish you all the best in that. I know it's a, it's a critical uh, part of your training schedule for the for the new season. When are you kicking off your preseason? Teams are already checking in for preseason. Yeah, we're in on Saturday, so we've got another few days. Um, so what's that? Another two days away. So two more days for guys. Guys are already starting to come back into Nairobi, yep. um, to make sure they're back in good time. So. You know, it's fitness testing this weekend, just yeah. to check where the guys are. The last thing we do at the end of a season is fitness testing. The first thing we do is fitness testing. We bring some outside experts in with all of their fancy technology, you know, heart rate, light <laughs> gates, all of those things. Yeah. So we'll be doing that this weekend. And then it's sort of full steam ahead because it's only four weeks to yeah. the 18th of August, which is when the Champions League kicks off. Do you think you have enough time to prepare for that? We do. Um, four weeks would seem four or five weeks. Obviously, we didn't know the dates of the Champions League until a week or so ago. Yeah. Um, we were always planning on a five-week preseason, which would have taken us to the 26th of August. Now, most teams normally do a six-week preseason, 
But the the science behind that is six weeks is required to get you back up to full fitness if you've had an eight week Little. off season. Yeah. Whereas our guys have had a four week off season. So had we done six weeks, we would have only given them three weeks off. And we sort of thought, let's split the difference. Let's give them four weeks off. Because you also know that first week off, there was a few engagements like dinners and stuff because we'd won the yeah. league. And so four weeks off, five weeks to the start of the KPL, ultimately the Champions League being a week earlier means it's four weeks into that. But they'll be coming back at a good fitness level because in four weeks you won't have lost much fitness. So they'll be fresh. I've spoken to a lot of guys this morning already. They're eager to get back in and they've had their off-season programs as well. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're comfortable with the length of preseason. Coach, uh, there was a lot of talk about you leaving at the end of the season, but from hearing how you talk, you seem to have a long-term plan uh, with the club. How long do you think we'll stay with Gormaya? It's hard to know, really. I think for me, it's always about, do I think the ambition of both me and the supporters and the players is being fulfilled? You know, are we able to move forward? Um, and that was the thing I said. Look, it's no secret. I've said this before that the the contract that I agreed here with Kogalo is the smallest financial contract I've agreed in over 15 years. <laughs> and in fact, in the last year, when I was out after leaving the Uganda Cranes, I had five different offers of which Kogalo was one. And Kogalo was the smallest. It was the smallest offer by a distance in some cases. Some things were two or three times as much. But for me, I'm very fortunate. Um, I've had some good jobs in the past that have paid well. And so I've, I've invested my money. I don't need to chase after a salary. Um, but here was a job I thought was interesting. I thought if we can get this team back to the number one position, back to competing on the continent, one, I thought that would be very good for all of our careers, but also that it would be hugely enjoyable because working with a group of ambitious, dedicated players week in, week out, day in, day out, is the most fulfilling part of being a football coach, of doing this job. And so I thought I would enjoy it. I thought it would be fun. And it has been fun. It's been enjoyable. And as long as it remains like that, as long as I feel as though we're being fulfilled as professionals and we're pushing forward, then I'll be here. There's no doubt about that. Um, but what the club are also fully aware of is that the moment I feel that there's a divergence in terms of what I think is right and what the club think is right, then I think at that point we would shake hands, remain good friends, but go our separate directions. But as long as we're both, you know, go running in the same direction, then, you know, I enjoy Nairobi. I enjoy the club. I, you know, love the players. Um, the staff are great. So, you know, for me, how long is a piece of string? It's as long as it needs to be. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, that was going to be my next question. How, how are you loving Kenya so far? What's your favorite thing about Kenya? Any delicacies that you enjoy so far? Yeah, I'm enjoying Kenya. I have to say it's in the last few weeks that I've been able to see a little bit more of it. Obviously, last season was a crazy, intense season. We were playing Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. So you really didn't get to see a lot of Kenya. Um, this coming season, maybe it's going to be a bit more relaxed. We're not going to have quite as many midweek games. You know, you might find this funny, but between the 1st of January and the 31st of March, so three months, we had three days off. Well, three days. Quite intense. So, you know, if it, after the matches, we have recovery days, we have, you know, all of this, but we had three days where we weren't at the training pitch in those months. So that shows you how intense it was. Yeah. Next year, if we don't have all these midweek games, we'll probably have a day off every week, um, hopefully. Good for the players as well. And so I think maybe you might be able to see a little bit more of Nairobi and Kenya. But, you know, I've really enjoyed it. You know, people have been incredibly warm and welcoming. Um, you know, the environment here in Kenya is nice. It's not too hot. A bit cold at the moment um, in, the, in the winter <laughs> yeah. here. But, you know, overall, it's been very good. Nairobi is a huge city. Um, like, I'm not one who runs around a lot. I live sort of in the suburbs. And, you know, you'll generally find me taking the dog for a walk in Karura Forest more than anything else. You know, yeah. I just like to relax in my time. But it's been enjoyable. Um, you know, the guys are always... We had a thing this season where there were certain criteria and certain in, in every match that if the guys hit certain criteria, 
that we would go out for like choma or barbecue and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, we've been out with the guys maybe five or six times this season to different sort of like good quality local restaurants, you know, and yeah, I enjoy trying all the different delicacies. Like I said to you before, is it uh, Mokimo? Mochimo um, <laughs> is quite nice. Um, Mokimo is your favorite. Yeah, yeah Mokimo is nice. I do enjoy it. Um, like, I, I'm not adverse to Ugali. If someone offers me Ugali, I don't think I would run towards it. Yeah. If there was multiple options, I might select something else. But I've got no problem with it. Um, and yeah, just, you know, yeah, the food here has been fine. It's, it's been good. Um, so what next for you after this Kogalo challenge? I know you, you mentioned that you're not sure how long you'll be here. You, you're looking like you're working on a long-term plan. Uh, but, you know, you've coached uh, the Uganda national team, Amavubi, the Rwandese uh, national team. Uh, previously, you were really into managing national teams. But you took up on, on this uh, Kogalo challenge. Now, w- what does the future hold for you? What does your career tra- trajectory look like? What are you envisioning? Do you want to now go after the Kogalo challenge because definitely at some point could be maybe after a few seasons you'll you'll move to another level are you looking to go back into the national team setup has the Harambe Stars job at any point crossed your mind are you now looking to move into proper club management with big African clubs look I think um, for me a journey in football is never one that you can map out accurately You know, for me, it's all about can you keep stepping forward, keep moving forward, making positive decisions, positive steps. But ultimately, all of your decisions and all of your opportunities are based on your success. You know, so for me to have any future beyond Kogalo, we've got to continue to win here. It's not just winning yesterday. Yesterday's gone. You know, you might not believe this, but in the dressing room after the Nairobi City Stars game, so everyone's celebrating And I pulled one of our executive committee members to the side and said to him, I need you to do these two things tomorrow regarding recruitment. So the game had only finished an hour (laughs) earlier. Everyone's celebrating. And look, I enjoyed it as well. We went out for dinner that night, et cetera, and I enjoyed the moment. But in that dressing room after that game, I was already talking to people of how do we win next season? Because we've got to keep winning. That is the pressure when you're in this game. And I'm incredibly fortunate already because of the tens, hundreds of thousands of football coaches who are working right now in the world, it's a vanishingly small amount who've won something. You look at coaches who've had fantastic careers and have never won anything. You know, we spoke about, you know, look at someone like the new Chelsea manager, Marcio Pochettino. You know, okay, maybe he did win something when he was at PSG. But again, he's had this great, great career, but there's not a a shelf load of trophies to show for it. You know, you look at someone like David Moyes, who has done fantastically well again at West Ham. I'm so pleased for him because he's a top, top manager. But... The Europe or the Europa Conference League was his first ever trophy as a manager after like 30 years. So I'm incredibly grateful to have been in a position to win some trophies over the years. But I also know if I want to maintain in this game, we've got to keep winning. And so that's the first thing. And look, whatever comes after Kogalo will be dictated by what happens at Kogalo. And so to look beyond that would be foolish in the extreme. So whether that is club, whether that is international, it'll become apparent at whatever stage it needs to. You're so outspoken. Uh, But coach, uh, I won't keep you for long. I know it's uh, the off season. You also need to relax. But I was hoping you would be on holiday. You know, it's normal for foreign coaches. And I'm sorry if this comes out bad to remain in Kenya after the end of the season. You know, we've had coaches who've left even three games to the end of the season. And it's become like a norm, but you're still in Kenya. You're starting your preseason on Saturday, which is a few days away. Uh, why are you still in Kenya? Why didn't you go for vacation or something? Well, there's a couple of things on that. Number one, you know, I, well, I've already said, you know, I didn't get the opportunity really to see much of Kenya during the season because we were so focused and so busy. And so the opportunity to stay here and go, we spent some time on the coast with, you know, my partner, with some close friends. We went over to the Diani coast and, you know, spent a week or so there. I'm a big fan of scuba diving, which you can obviously do very well here. I've been trying to convince my assistant coach, Michael Nam, to join (laughs) me, but he's like saying, no, no, I'll never get him underneath (laughs) the water. He's happy on top of the water. Um, But one day, maybe. And so, you know, I enjoy nature. We've done some sort of things in terms of the safaris and stuff. Um, 
of the last sort of 13 years of my life, I've spent about 10 to 11 of them on the African continent. I feel at home here. Um, I'm not, even when I was a national team coach, you know a lot of national team coaches who do not live in the country. Yeah, um, yeah. When I was Uganda, when I was Rwanda, when I was a Sierra Leone, I lived in the country. If I, if I needed to go and sc scout outside, I flew out to do it and I came home to those countries. So yes, I own a house in another part of the world, but my home at this moment in time is Kenya. And so for me, there's no need to go around. We're in one of the best countries for leisure time yeah. in terms of the things you can do here, whether you're you know, someone who's really adventurous, whether you're someone who wants to relax, you know, there's so much to do here. So that's number one. I feel at home here. I wanted to spend my time here. You mentioned other coaches who maybe go, I just can't believe that's allowed to happen. Um, it has happened. Like, and it's not just even historically at this club it's happened. You know, you look in newspapers and you see, you know, such and such is missing for games. Now, look, I understand sometimes there might be emergencies, you know, family matters, or there might be, you know, medical issues or whatever. And that's, I'm not talking about that. But for example, at Christmas time, my partner is Mexican. And so we spent sort of Christmas with her family in Mexico City. And we were coming back and I actually, our game, our last game of the, the before Christmas got moved by a day, which meant I either had to change my flight or I had to miss the game. And I was told, oh no, it's all right, like your assistant can take the game. And I was like, that can't be how it works. You can't miss a game because you're going on holiday. Yeah. And so for me, you know, I can't remember how much it cost. It cost a reasonable amount of money. We changed the air ticket. And it meant I only got to spend, you know, six days in Mexico instead of eight days. And even coming back, you know, I could have came back later, but we actually, I left on New Year's Eve in Mexico because we were starting training on New Year's Day yep. and I needed to be at the training session. I landed at Jomo Kenyatta at 6 a.m. in the morning and was at Toyoyo for 7.30 setting up training. I got changed in the dressing room at Toyoyo. So look, everyone can do their own thing. But for me, if I expect my players to give me everything in pursuit of winning, if I expect the executive committee to put everything on the table in pursuit of winning, then how can I give anything less than everything? And that means sacrifices, yes, but this is not prison. Yeah. I'm choosing to do this. And so if I'm choosing to do it, I'm going to choose to do it to the best of my ability. Final uh, question to you, Coach. If there's one thing that you'd like to change or you had the powers to change in Kenyan football, what would that be? Um, I would love every team to have their own facility. I really would. Like if you look across, I think the great template is um, Azam yeah, over yeah. in Tanzania where they've got the Chamazi complex, where they've got a training pitch, they've got the mini, the stadium, whatever it is, like 6,000 seater or something. Yeah. Um, they've got their accommodation block for their youth team, they've the got gym, a gym, they've they got the pool, there. all of that. It's very, very good. And I think really that's what teams should be targeting. Um, I see a lot of big stadiums get built that don't get finished. Yeah. You know, you can look at every region in Kenya and probably point to a stadium that hasn't hosted a football match in years. Yeah. Maybe never hosted a football match because they start building this like 30,000 seater stadium for no need. Because with all due respect, why, why do Matari United or why do KCB or why do police need a 30,000 seater stadium? I actually am a big supporter. Police have obviously built there the Police Sacco Stadium, yeah. and they will continue to develop it over the coming years. I think you drive past it. I've not been inside it myself because we didn't play there this season, but you drive, you see it when you're on the highway, yeah. and I think that's a perfect template yeah. for what teams should try to do. Now, Gore's maybe a little bit different. We should be targeting to build maybe a 20,000-seater stadium, yeah. but for the majority of teams, something like, uh, Azam have in Tanzania would be perfect and you incorporate the training facility and the match facility all on one plot of land and you have something that the club can rely on for generations to come. I hope we live to see that one day in Kenyan football. So do I. So your final parting shot? 
just, um, you know, we're starting a new season and really just encouraging not just the Kogalo fans, but all fans of football in Kenya, come and watch the games. Come and watch live football. I know there's a lot of football on the TV, whether it's the Premier League or La Liga or the Champions League, and it's really easy to go and do that, you know, but there's nothing like live football. There's nothing like 11 v 11 being in the stadium, being part of something, the highs and the lows that you experience with that. Um, so I would fully encourage either people who've maybe stepped away from it to get back on board yeah. or people who haven't done it before, come and experience a game, see what you think, and hopefully you'll keep coming. Thank you so much, Coach, for your time, and I wish you all the very best uh, in the coming season. No, thank you very much, Jeff. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure's all mine, Coach. Thank you.